Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to Toronto Apologetics. Uh, my name is Tony Costa, and uh, I want to welcome you all here uh, tonight. And um, I was just previously on uh, my dear brother Al Fadi's um, uh, uh, YouTube channel on uh, Sierra International, and we were just having a prelude. I'm just going to bring him on now. Uh, dear brother Al, how are you doing? Thank you for this first time appearance on, uh, on my show. I am honored by this invitation, and I hope uh, that uh, it will be one of many, and not just for myself, but uh, many wonderful, uh, you know, uh, servant of the Lord that will be on your channel. I've always been blessed to have you, brother, uh, along with others Thank you. as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and so, friends, uh, I want to share a little bit about uh, my, my brother here. Uh, he gave me a long bio, and I get the same complaints, brother. When I give my bio, people say, this is way too long. And so uh, I've, I've been asked to glean uh, some of the most pertinent parts of, uh, of Brother Al's um, uh, biography here. So let me just give you a bit of a background. Uh, Al Fadi is a former devout Muslim from Saudi Arabia, and he is now a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Sira International, a consulting agency focused on training and equipping leaders in the field of Islamic studies and political Islam through training seminars, online webinars, and global media outreach, lectures, podcasts, and videos. As an ex-Muslim, Al-Fadi has the expertise to bring awareness about Islam, to train like-minded leaders to combat the political Islamic agenda, and to assist policymakers. Since the inception of Sierra International in 2002, it had the privilege of training thousands of conservative Christians in churches, parachurch organizations, and various conservative Christian colleges and seminaries. Um, Al, Al has tons of, uh, of uh, social network uh, connections, and uh, he's appeared in, in, in various uh, TV programs, podcasts dealing with Islam. And uh, the one thing that really uh, gladdens my heart here is that uh, Brother L um, is also uh, currently a, uh, a PhD candidate with the Melbourne School of Theology, uh, which gladdens my heart because I know a couple of the, the, the scholars there, Dr. Mark Dury, who I believe is your doctoral, your Dr. Vater, your doctoral father. A supervisor, and also uh, Dr. Bernie Powers. Uh, so I'm really glad, brother, and I look forward to the day that I can call you Dr. Al Fadi, uh, and I and okay. I really do. I really do. Uh, so thank you so much, brother, for coming on on the show. Those of you who are interested uh, to learn more about Brother Al Fadi, please go to to the uh, description box. I've given you some links to his website, his YouTube channel, uh, and another resources that would avail you. Um, so the reason why I wanted you to come on, Brother Al, is if you could just share with our viewers um, your background in Islam. Uh, and I understand you were part of a very rigid uh, uh, school of Islam, the Wahhabis. Um, if you can say a little bit about that, since you came from the very heartland of Islam, uh, which is, is, is Saudi Arabia, uh, if you can just uh, take us back on a journey of your life and share how uh, you came to know the Lord Jesus, but beginning with your upbringing as a Muslim. Absolutely. It'd be my privilege. Um, I'm born and raised in Saudi, and uh, the fact that you are from Saudi, you are automatically a Muslim, obviously, and I would argue that you are automatically a, a very knowledgeable Muslim, because in Saudi, Islam is taught uh, from a very young age, uh, everywhere you go, there is a mosque, you're taught this at the school, you go to the university, you are taught Islam. And in fact, religious studies at the university level has to do with Islam only. It's not like a comparative right. religion and you want to learn about Judaism or Christianity or anything like that. Your knowledge about Christianity in this case is that it's just a religion that happened to come before Islam and it got corrupted over the course of time and the signs of corruption is that the Bible is no longer valid, the claim that Jesus was crucified, the claim that Jesus is the Son of God, and so on and so forth. And somehow the God of Islam decided to send the prophet of Islam to fix all of that. But the only distinction between Islam and anything that came before it is that Islam is a universal religion, and the Quran is the only perfectly preserved book now out of all the other books that the God of Islam sent. And I believed it with all my heart, of course. 
And, uh, you know, so I was religious, you can say, but I became more and more devout as I started it to dig deeper into Islam. Now, I'm not saying uh, that the other Saudis were not religious, but to get to that level of devotion, is that what we call uh, uh, kind of like a reformed Muslim? That's why we call it Wahhabism. It's named after Muhammad Abdul Wahhab in the 18th century, who was a reformer, actually. All he did is brought Islam in the Arabian Peninsula back to what we call the age of the Salaf, which is the early Islam. It's almost like equivalent to what we call the early church father's time or the apostolic right. age, if you wish. So he was disturbed by many of the innovations and activities that Muslims were doing in the Arabian Peninsula, realizing that the prophet of Islam wanted to cleanse the Arabian Peninsula from any idolatry. So he went and fought and really uh, w uh, went after the uh, Shia very hard, actually. Uh, and uh, as that's why there is enmity, by the way, between the Sunnis and the Shia, even till this day, not just uh, the one that started at the beginning of the history of Islam, but even during the Wahhabi movement. So, uh, you know, I, I learned these simple facts. Um, you know, I call it the finality of Islam or the psychology of Islam. You're following the final religion and its final message and its final messenger. It's almost, I, I use this example over and over again when I'm teaching uh, and I tell my students, think of iPhone. If I tell you which iPhone version you would like to have, you probably will say, I would love to have the latest version, right? You know, right. not Islam. Islam is the latest version. So when you hear as a Muslim Christianity, you think it's the older version of iPhone and you're like, I don't want to go there. So even... Sharing about Christianity is key, brother, because I've always grown up believing that it's a religion versus the idea that it's actually a restored relationship with God. And that's extremely important because I never heard it that way. So this is how I grew up, very devout, very focused. And then in the uh, late 70s, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. You probably remember yep. that in yep. 1979. And scores of young Muslims, by the approval of their governments, by the way, back then it wasn't called terrorism or anything like that. In fact, the government of Saudi and Egypt and others supported many of these young men to go to Afghanistan and to form what is called the Mujahideen or the Fighters for God. And no other than Osama bin Laden was among those who left. He was from my, my own town, by the way, right. went to my own oh. university. I've known his cousins. And I was actually excited. That's why wow, one of our own actually went over there. Maybe I should go and consider joining him. Now, I was still a teenager at that time, uh, and a young teenager. And I was reading about what the prophet taught concerning jihad and the rewards for the martyrs and all that kind of stuff. And that got me even more excited because in Islam, it's a religion of works. You have to rely on your good deeds. But only if you're willing to fight for God in a what is called for the cause of Allah or Sabilillah, and you die, you shed your own blood, your sins will be forgiven, there'll be no judgment, and you'll go straight to paradise. It's the gospel, except individualized rather than to rely on the work of Christ. Right. I mean, I didn't know that back then, but now I look at it and it's kind of like the gospel in, re in reverse. So I wanted really to go to Afghanistan, but I was hesitant. Uh, because I didn't know how to convince my family uh, to let me go. So I approached them because I needed their permission, especially my mother. And I said, you know, I can earn a lot of good deeds. I just go and serve for a few months and come back. And my mother can smell blood. And she's like, no, you're not going anywhere. And she forbade me from even thinking about this idea. And I was concerned if I would to disobey her and end up going and dying. What if God didn't even accept my work? So I stayed behind. And... Um, uh, went to uh, finish the high school, went to uh, the Islamic University in Mecca for about a year and a half. Then I changed my mind about specializing in Sharia law and returned back to my city. And I went to the university and I got a degree in engineering. Up until this point, I'm still a Muslim. I'm not down in Islam, but I've never also encountered a born again Christian in my life. That happened basically in the late 80s when I ended up coming to the States mm -hmm. uh, to pursue my graduate degree in engineering. And it was, um, you know, the first month was really a struggle for me outside of the classroom because I needed to communicate with people. But I noticed that in America, they speak Americanese, brother. They don't speak English. <laughs> yeah. And Christianese. <laughs> yeah. And they would use like idioms such as what's up. And I would literally, 
lift my head up. And every time they ask me, it's like, I don't know what is up. Why is everybody asking me about something that is up there? And I struggled that way and finally went to my teacher. And I says, is it possible for me to stay in the center for English for maybe another year or so? And she's, she was puzzled. She's like, why? I mean, you're doing fine. I said, well, maybe I'm doing fine here, but outside I'm not doing well. And I explained to her what's going on. She laughed and she's, oh, those are idioms, actually. Yeah. All you need to do, she said, just build a relationship with Americans. And when they say something like this, just stop them and say, could you please explain it to me? And they will be more than happy to help you understand how to use these phrases and put them in context. But I said, you know what? I can't really interrupt people, you know, when they're talking. I mean, I'm thinking like my culture now, you know. Yeah, of course. And she's like, no, no, it'll be fine. I said, no, I, I don't think I can do this. Is there another solution? She said, well, you know, I can give you the uh, address to the uh, office for the international students, which building, uh, and you can go there and tell them about the problem. And they definitely can connect you with an individual or family. There is a lot of uh, uh, people that want to volunteer to help people like yourself. I said, okay, that sounds like an idea. So I went, they asked me for my profile. So they gave me a piece of paper. I filled out some things about myself and they said, okay, we'll try to match you with someone. A couple of weeks later, I received a letter and saying that they were able to match me with a specific family who was seeking someone like myself. Now, I did not know this was a Christian ministry, by the way. I was thinking it just people want to help me. And that was the first time I met for the first time a Christian who was born again. Now, I didn't know that. But in my mind, when I came to the States, or even if I went to Canada or anywhere in Europe, I would have uh, you know, thought that I'm going to a Christian nation because this is what Islam right. teaches us. The West is connected with Christianity. You are born a Christian person. And yes, Christians sometimes act bad simply because their book is corrupt. I mean, that's what I was told. Now, up until the time I met this family, I can tell you the American students did not at all disappoint me. The language they used and the profanity and everything, exactly what I was watching in the Hollywood movies. And I'm yep. like, yep, I'm in America, that's for sure. But then this family came and all of a sudden they are nice, kind, gentle, loving. They went out of their way to help me with many things. Initially, I was saying, maybe they're being nice to me just because I'm kind of like a new person. But after a while, I started to notice that's, that's who they are. That's their lifestyle. And I was touched by that, brother. And then they invited me to, you know, we have, uh, we celebrate Thanksgiving uh, here in the U.S. And then they invited me to my first Thanksgiving meal. And they ended up inviting their parents, some of their church friends, some of their neighbors. And I can tell there is something strange and unique about this whole group. Meaning everyone that I consider to be Christian outside of that house always acted different than the way these people are acting. And I, and I started to ask questions and they would ask me about my background and, and then they prayed with me and they prayed for me. And, uh, and they, you can tell the seed was planted, brother. Within a couple of months, I changed my major and uh, I ended up moving from that campus to another. Now we're talking early 90s and you know what happened in the early 90s. There is no internet, yep. there is no Google, there is no WhatsApp, there is no Facebook, there is no YouTube. Uh, imagine people these days with none of these. I mean, they'll probably commit suicide. But back then it was like this. And on top of this, in those days, if you move just literally, literally from one town to the other, you have to change your phone number because the area code would change. So I obviously moved, never bothered to tell the family about my move, never bothered to call them back later and give them my new number or new address and move down with my life. And they probably assumed that I returned back home. Then I graduated from my um, engineering program. I got a job offer and I said, wow, I'll take advantage of that because my family was already excited that I'm getting an American degree and now I'm going to be getting a practical experience as well. So initially the idea was to go back home with more experience and getting these good jobs and good income and good benefits and everything. But then I started to chase the American dream and you know, bought a house and married and have a child and all that kind of stuff. And um, at the same time, I am interacting with people over faith matters. And then I met another couple who reminded me of that couple that I met initially. But I was ready. I felt like I was ready to engage them in religious discussions. So obviously, I went for the jugular. And I start to tell him, your book is corrupt. And Jesus was never crucified. And he never you know, said, I am God, worship me. And all that kind of stuff right. uh, that uh, our Muslim friends pull on us. And uh, 
And the thing that struck me the most about this couple also is that they were confident on their faith. They weren't shaken by what I said. If I deny the deity of Christ, they'll take their time to show me why they believe he is God or God incarnate. But then they'll ask me to prove my objection. If I say the Bible is corrupt, they'll share with me why they believe in the Bible and manuscript evidence and archaeology and all that kind of stuff. Then they ask me to prove why I deny the Bible. And it went like this. And pretty quickly, brother, I discovered that I am standing on nothing. Wow. I was just like a parrot babbling things, parroting things, not knowing why I'm saying them because I didn't have even a shred of evidence to share with them. And yet here they are, not shaken at all by my accusations. Actually, they're becoming stronger and stronger in defending their faith, brother. That's what apologetics is, defending right. their faith and standing with confidence. Now, the thing that has struck me the most as an engineer, I am in the field of construction management and uh, you know building projects and so many other things. I can tell you this much, brother, as an engineer, if you were to tell me, Al, why don't we just, you know, by faith, go ahead and build this building on this uh, land and just see what happens. I'll look at you and say, absolutely not. I want to make sure I have good soil and I want to make sure that it sustains, you know, the concrete yep. and it withstand the weight of the building and the type of foundation. I'm not that crazy to build a building without knowing what's going to happen. And here I am. I'm willing to actually follow a religion, not knowing where I'm going. And what's going to happen to me? And why do I even believe in these things anymore? So that was the first turning point for me. And I began to realize I am really not standing on solid ground. And I know I'm sorry I've, I've taken longer than I should, but I'll, I'll stop here if you want to elaborate. Sure, sure not talk. at all. That is, that is just fantastic. I mean, you were insulated in Saudi Arabia. It's, bit, it's insular in that they don't allow churches there. They don't allow synagogues. No other houses of worship are permitted in Saudi Arabia. And that all goes back to Muhammad. I will expel the Jews and the Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and leave none but Muslim. Uh, but the idea is no religion is accepted. So you were left in a, in a place where there was no critical thinking. It was just, this is Islam. This is the Quran. And so I can understand how your world was just overturned when you met these Christians and then they started asking questions of, of your convictions and, and to prove it and so forth. And it's just amazing how God providentially, in retrospect, when you think of how your mother kept you from running off to Afghanistan, which could have resulted in your death, how God providentially even used your mother to keep you from going there so that you can come to the United States and, and be influenced by these Christian families. And so, uh, I mean, it's amazing how Jesus said that People will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And I think you saw that tangible love in that in those families. And then this is the earmark of every believer in Christ is that that love that we have, not just for God, but for our neighbor, is something that should should be reflective in our lives. And and yet God used it to to woo you, if you will, to woo you towards him. Uh and so what happened next, brother? You came to the United States, you 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 were exposed to this Christian family, these born again believers. Um, so what was it? What was, uh, what eventually was the clincher to, for you to, to convince you that um, I need Christ, I, I'm lost? Amen. So, so throughout the course of uh, uh, this dialogue, if you wish, with this second family, more seeds are being planted and more seeds of doubt are being planted as well. And I started to really see myself declining in, in terms of my allegiance to Islam because I felt like, man, there is nothing to stand on, but I'm still not doubting it. You know, the problem with Islam is like it, it has a grip on you. You know, you feel like this is you feel like you start getting more stubborn to try to prove that it is still the right way but maybe you didn't learn it correctly or you're not practicing it correctly or you're not really equipped enough to defend it. But I was, you know, by any stretch of imagination, I was among the, those who were passionate about the faith and zealot for it. So if I, the zealot Muslim from Saudi, didn't know how to answer these questions, so how can others do? You know, I mean, that's what I kept telling myself. Right. And it went like this for a couple of years, and then I lost my father uh, because of cancer. That really left a, a, a huge gap in my heart. And it was during that time that I started to 
even doubt Islam altogether. I mean, you can say I became agnostic and maybe even uh, atheist, even though I never declared myself to be that way, but I was just troubled by everything that is happening and what I'm hearing and what I'm learning about Islam and, and ability to defend it. And God used all of that. And the family kept inviting me to go to church with them and I kept refusing. But then um, I ended up leaving where I was living for about a year and came back and it was the most... Um, you know, time of my life where I struggled at all levels. And it was officially the turning point for me. You know, sometimes God brings us to our knees to finally recognize our need for him. Right. And it was at that time, at the end of 2000, I returned back to where I was living. Uh, you know, so I moved temporarily for one year for a job uh, opportunity, came back again uh, to my uh, previous place. And uh, it's at that time that I was open now to go to church. And I did that for the first time in May of 2001. And I started to hear the gospel being preached from the pulpit. And it's exactly, it's the same message, obviously, that people shared with me. And that was kind of like, wow, I mean, it's it's everything I heard so far. But now, because it was being preached and it was being exposited from the scripture, I'm seeing the scriptural support for these things as well. I'm hearing right. it. And it went like this for a few months. September 11 happened. That weekend, I was terrified. I didn't want to go to that church. I said, everybody knows, first, I'm, a, I'm from Saudi, and I am a Muslim, and I'm not a believer. And 15 out of the 19 hijackers were Saudi. They all were Muslims, and they did it because in the name of God, like I was going to do it myself. So what if they lash out at me because of the, the, the damage that happened because of it? But my friends convinced me that going is always going to be the good idea because no Christians will attack me. None of this is going to happen to me. I'll be safe. And I'm glad I did. I went and they preached from the Sermon on the Mount about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecuted you. And brother, I can tell you that that was the tipping point right there. Wow. But it took me two more months. During these two more months, uh, mo more months I should say, before making my uh, final confession and praying and accepting the Lord as, uh, as uh, Lord and Savior, I started to get this you can call it a dream. I call it a nightmare. Watching and seeing myself dead, died, standing before the throne of God on judgment day. And he's asking me one question. Why did you reject my son? And the first time it happened to me, I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, the God of Islam is not going to ask me about a son. He doesn't even believe he has a son. So it dawned on me. It's like, oh, this is this God of the church where I go. He's asking me about Jesus, his son. Why is he asking me about it? So it happened a couple of times. It's almost like you hit the repeat you right, know, button right. and the same nightmare comes back again. And I'm like, <laughs> I guess, what if I die today? And that would be the question I could ask. What am I supposed to say? And it was then that it really hit me and realized Jesus is the answer. It's either Jesus or nothing. And in November of 2001, I accepted him as Lord and Savior, brother. That was wow. the tipping point. And the that was your spiritual birthday. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Praise God for that. And Amen. it's amazing, uh, Brother Al, that it, it's not just you, but other Muslims have shared with me. I mean, you hear a lot of, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of hoaxes out there about, about a lot of people say, oh, Jesus appeared to this guy, Jesus appeared to that guy. And then people become rich off writing books about that. But I have, I've met Muslims who are, who were sincere in their confession. And, and this, the sense that they have these dreams where, where either the Lord Jesus confronts them and calls them to himself, or in your case, God, the father says, uh, what, what, uh, why did you reject my son? And so forth. It's amazing how God does these things. And, and it's amazing. It always comes down to Jesus, doesn't it? it it's like you said, it's like, it's Jesus or nothing. Uh, and so I, I'm just, I'm just amazed at how God providentially moved you from Saudi Arabia to come to the United States to meet up with these families. And then, and then of course, 9 11 happens. No one can forget, you know, everybody, knows where they were at that moment when they first heard about the towers being struck and so forth. And then for you to hear those wonderful words of Jesus, that is the opposite of Muhammad, to love your enemies and to do good to those who despitefully use you, where Muhammad in the Quran, as you know, it, it says that uh, those who are with him are merciful one to another, but they are, they are, they are very uh, crude and, and very uh, rough and, 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 and right. hateful towards the unbelievers. So what, what an amazing, you have to hear that sermon, I guess, to, 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 
to to make you see that Christianity is very different than Islam. Absolutely. And that was really, I mean, you mentioned uh, chapter 48, verse 29 in the Quran, and that's exactly what it says. And uh, yet here is Jesus is saying, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute. And that, that's the first time, thing that came to my mind. And I said this, it's a very simple argument. I'm an engineer. It's all about logic. If the God of the Bible is the God of Islam, then why in the world did he change his mind? Right. You see, that's what hit me. It's like, why did he change his mind over the course of 600 years to tell me to hate my enemies? And at the same time, now I know why all of these wonderful families that loved me and cared for me, why they were acting this way. Because Jesus commanded them to do this, and they were doing it in obedience to him. Right. So they didn't for a second, even with September 11, that would have given them the opportunity to lash out at me. They actually loved me and embraced me. And, and it right. was puzzling to me. Right. Amazing testimony. So tell us, brother, what happened with your family? Because now that you confess Christ, you become a believer, uh, you, you were baptized, uh, your parents now see you as a murtad, as an apostate as one who has left Islam. And, and as you know, under the Sharia, the, the Islamic law, Muhammad said, uh, whoever leaves his religion uh, of Islam, kill him. So now you're an apostate. Uh, you are certifiably a, an apostate in the eyes of, of Islam. What was your parents' reaction to this? I know your father had passed, but what was your mother's reaction to this or your siblings or your immediate family? Well, I mean, there, there's a couple of things happened before I got to that point. I mean, uh, accepted Christ, and I lost my marriage immediately. Oh, so and you were married in Saudi? At, at no, that? no, I was married actually to someone who's not even a Muslim, to be honest okay. with you. It okay. shows how okay. Satan uses these things. Okay. I lost the marriage. It impacted me. And uh, September 11 impacted the economy. I lost the, the job. I lost my income. I ended up losing my car, losing my house. And all of a sudden, I found myself from here all the way down to the bottom. It's almost like God was saying, you know what? And, and I have to say this, uh, brother, we from Saudi are proud people. And I think God says, you know, what? I'm going to take the pride out of you one way or another and teach you how to depend on me. And that's how it went for me. And then uh, within seven to eight months later, I feel like I can see light at the end of the tunnel. People were discipling me, assuring me that I made the right decision. Spiritual warfare is something expected and so on and so forth. So it was an opportunity for discipleship. And then I went to Saudi and I really was afraid of telling my family face to face. So I returned back to the States and that was the last time I was there. And, and then a couple of years, at least three more years of being discipled, growing in my faith. And then I ended up meeting my bride, you know, and uh, uh, she is a former Muslim herself and a believer in Christ. When I met her, she was already uh, a believer. And in fact, uh, you know, the passage that was the tipping point for her comes from John 15, 13. Uh, uh, n you know, uh, no better friends than this, that one can give his life for his friends or no right. better man than this, you know, that uh, a man will, will die for his friends. And I just preached it this Sunday, actually, that passage. And it was a privilege really to do that, uh, to remember her journey. But, but all that to say, brother, is... Um, when we uh, were getting ready to get married, I was introduced to a former Muslim from Morocco by the name of Brother Rashid. Who oh, yes. Own show. Yes. And Rashid uh, was so excited that I'm marrying also someone from his own country and uh, a believer, of course, and asked me if I were to appear on his show and share my testimony. And here is, here is me, you know, that people know me, you know. I was a chicken back then. And I said, no, could, could you hide my face? Uh, can people not hear my voice? And Rashid looked at me and says, I'm not going to do this because we need to be genuine. We're not ashamed of the gospel. Right. And if you want to share it, we'll share it with our faith. I remember really being shaken by what he says. And I waited a couple of months. And then finally I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So I told my wife, are you okay with me appearing on TV? Because that's it. Once I appear, it is a done deal. Right. We prayed and she said, yes. So we got married. Three months later, I appeared for the first time on satellite program that was in December of 2007. And I shared my testimony, brother, and my family watched. Wow. Along with 60 million other people. I'm, I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I'm bringing down the ship, I'm, I'm going down big, brother. You know, that's... <laughs> yeah, guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it didn't go well. It did not go well to answer your question. I was hated, rejected, and uh, didn't talk to me for a while, for a long time, actually. My brother was going nuts and outraged over all of this. But all that to say, brother, is, is that 
something happened when I shared my testimony. A Saudi woman by the name of Fatima Materi accepted Christ that week. And oh, she wow. cited my testimony as one of the reasons why. Not that I'm, I was the tipping point, but she'd been seeking the truth, doubting Islam. But my testimony was one of those things along the way that gave her confidence that her doubts are real. She's not the only one from Saudi that thinks this way. And nine months later, I was with Rashid doing another show this time. And he passed me a paper. It says Fatma Materi was killed yesterday by her brother and father when they discovered that she became an apostate. And that shook me up to the core. In fact, brother, I was invited to uh, Voice of the Martyrs headquarters in Oklahoma. And I went there and they have a whole a wall of martyrs, they call it, outside. And I saw her name at the top, and I really wept. I mean, I just oh, yeah. couldn't hold my emotions. Uh, but what I learned from that lesson is this. Media is amazing. And you can go even beyond the boundaries of Saudi, and I can reach my Saudi people that, that, that way. But also, I better know what I'm talking about because people are watching and making right. life turning this point decisions, eternal life decisions on account of what you say. That's where I learned apologetics is important. Defending the faith is important, but learning the foundation of my faith is even more important. And that was the beginning of my media career, brother. And uh, that was back in 2008. I ended up going to seminary, studying uh, under the likes of Dr. Wayne Grudem and others like him. And it took me six more years, but two years later in 2010, I lost my engineering job because the economy was also in the tank in those days, was even worse than it happened in the last year. And I ended up basically realizing that I have to make a choice to serve the Lord full time or to keep my eye on material thing and follow uh, you know, the worldly uh, approach. And uh, I chose to serve him full time. And uh, what a journey it has been. Uh, I got into wow. uh, expanded our media. We had our YouTube channel and did a couple of other things, and uh, you know, I'm involved in Bible translations and so many other things right now. So, wow, brother, uh, you, I mean, you just floored me there. Uh, I mean, you know, I, one of the things I always tell our, our Christian brothers and sisters, especially those who have been raised in a Christian family, they don't count the cost of following Christ because some of them grow in a family where they heard the gospel, you know, they're saved and so forth but they don't know what it's like to suffer for the cause of Christ and to suffer for the sake of his name. And yet what I find in my Muslim brothers and sisters is that they know what it, what it counts. You lost your, your marriage, you lost your job, you lost uh, your, well, for a while, your family relations and so forth. And it's amazing that, you know, the Bible says those, the, that God humbles, he humbles the proud. And, and, and he humbles us so that he could raise us up in, in due time. And, and yet, one of the things that breaks my heart is when I hear about this dear sister who gave her life, she sealed her testimony in her own blood, Fatima. And, and I think of many others uh, that have given their lives for the cause of Christ. And, and brothers and sisters, those who are watching this program, those of you raised in the church, we've become so complacent We've become so lazy. We, we don't understand what it means to be persecuted, to have your life in danger. Look at Brother L. He had to come on a program and he had to sweat buckets about showing his face on, 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 on live and because of what would happen. Have you counted the cost? Jesus calls us to take up the cross and to follow him daily. And to, to bear the cross is the only people who, who carried the cross were those who were going to their deaths. And Jesus invites us to follow him, to die to ourselves, take up the cross, give up your, your, your needs, give up your interests and put them first and realize that without the cross, there is no resurrection. We cannot rise to eternal life in Christ unless we've died to our old selves. And so, you know, brother, your, your words have just impacted me because it's, you know, we're on the open doors and voice of the martyrs. We, we've been connect with them. And we hear about these brothers around the world. Even now in Nigeria, there's a, there's a huge persecution against our Christian brothers and sisters in Nigeria. But brother, you just prove what the scripture says, that, that to follow Jesus involves sometimes losing everything, you know, like Job did. Uh, and, and so I, I just want to tell you, brother, how much your, your testimony has impacted me as well, that 
you know, you're telling me things about your life, obviously, that I, I didn't know, but it just it just really humbles me that you've suffered so much for the sake of the gospel. And and we're just so comfortable here in the West. Amen. And um, a song comes to my mind. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Yeah. And yeah. my Muslim friends think like it's just um, Al Fadi is doing it for money. I laugh. I say money. Yeah. What money? But yeah. money, there is no money in the world worth losing the love of your mother and your sisters. And I haven't hugged my mother in 20 years. I mean, you know how hard it is, uh, brother. I mean, yet oh, yeah. I do it because I love my people. I want him to have the same joy that Christ ha uh, gave Amen. to me. Amen. And uh, yeah, I lost my mother back in 96, 1996 to cancer. And so uh, I can imagine uh, the pain uh, that that you go through. And yet, isn't that what Jesus said, that I've come into this world to set a father against his son and a son against the father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, brother-in-law, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and so forth. And he says, those of your, your only those among your own family, your enemies would be those among your own family. And it's not because of hatred. It's because Jesus Christ is divisive. He is the dividing line. And so you make it or break it with Jesus. And if he's not Lord of all, uh, Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Uh, and so uh, what, what doctrine in Christianity, brother, can you tell us was probably the most challenging? Was it the Trinity, the idea of God's triune nature? Was it the idea that Jesus Christ was God and man at the same time? Can you share with us what was the, the doctrine that you really struggled with as a yeah. Christian? After I accepted Christ, um, God has a sense of humor, by the way. Uh, he, he started to open doors for me to teach at Sunday schools. And really, the teaching was sharing my testimony. And I got so excited, and I thought, this is my ministry. And then slowly and gradually, they start to ask me about teaching uh, the Christians on Islam. I mean, it was confusing at the beginning. I'm like, why do I want to teach you on Islam? And like, no, no, because we want to reach Muslims effectively. I said, oh, okay, so you want to just understand the faith and what they believe in, and okay, so I did it. And then they start asking me, so what do Muslims object to? And I knew the objections by heart. I, they object to this, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the Bible is corrupt. So how do we respond? And I paused, and I'm like, how do we respond? That's a good question. How do I respond to these uh, objections? And that was the turning point for me, realizing I have to learn how to defend my faith. So the Trinity was definitely complex and the deity of Christ along with that. And not to mention the authority of the Bible, because if, if you are going to share anything, it's from the Bible and Muslims love to attack the Bible left and right. And brother, people don't, I mean, don't realize why I love Sam Shimon. Sam spent two years discipling me in all of these topics, two years. I still have the notebook about this thick. Yeah. The brother bored out his heart for me and taught me everything I wanted to know in a Sam Shimon classic approach, you know? And I loved how he recalled numbers and verses and I got excited and I started to do the same. I wow. mean, the Lord just blessed me with the ability to recall where to go and find something. And at the same time, I began to realize if you want to learn, you ought to learn and teach others immediately. That's the best way to learn it and retain it. So every time I learned something from Sam, I would go and teach it at the churches. And that's when I realized apologetic is really my calling. I just love right. it. I mean, I, I'm a Middle Eastern. We love to argue anyway. So <laughs> apologetics is just perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, you, well, Sam is is also known as the Assyrian Encyclopedia. And so, <laughs> yeah, he 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 could recall verses and passages and and and. And obviously, you, you seem to have that gift, too. And I, I thank God I have that gift. I think it's almost a gift for apolog apologists to have this instant recall. Uh, and, and, but isn't it interesting, brother, that it's interesting. Jesus uh, was a teacher. He taught his disciples. And, you know, the word disciple, uh, mathites in the Greek, the word disciple literally means a learner. Uh, a and lifelong so, learner. Yeah, yeah. It's where we get the word. Well, the word mathematics means a discipline. But... The, the idea of Mathetes was that Jesus taught his learners, he taught his disciples, so that they in turn can make disciples of other nations, of the nations, as he commanded them in Matthew 28, 19. And so it, it's it's just marvelous that 
we're carrying the baton, are we not? I mean, the Lord Jesus appointed his apostles and then uh, and through the apostles, the church started to grow and they passed on that baton. You know, Jude said, verse three, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And so it's just marvelous how God has blessed you with, with teachers and, and now you're taking that knowledge and you're sharing it with others so that they too will one day carry that baton and also share the message and, and, and with others. So that's, that's amazing. So where does it stand right now, Al, with your family? Have any of them, uh, at least, uh, have they been open to you? Have they talked to you? Have the lines of communication been opened? Yes, I mean, due to the illness of my mother and also an illness related to my brother, there has been some open communications. I mean, you can tell there is hurt, but at least I'm thankful uh, the door is opening up. Good. And uh, I'm just praying for them. And and uh, the problem is it's so hard to witness to your family, actually. I yes. mean, it's yes. much harder than to witness to people, obviously. But uh, uh, God is uh, wise and he knows what's best uh, for yeah. them. And then we pray that they will be surrounded by believers. Yeah. But another, another uh, uh, story, brother, related to that first family that um, uh, the Lord used to plant that first, first seed, you know, when I first came to the States. When I separated from them, that was within the first few months of meeting them and first year, really, of being here in the States. It took me 12 years journey to come to Christ. And I remember them immediately when I accepted Christ. And I wanted to find them and thank them for how God used them in my life. But it took me 10 more years, brother, to find them. Of course. 22 years have passed. Wow. Until I finally was able to find them through Google, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and uh, I guess God was waiting for Google uh, to come on board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I connected with them. And they told me this. I said, you know, I hope you left him a voice message. I said, I hope you remember who I was. This is so-and-so. I stayed at your house a couple of times. And uh, they responded back in a text message. Uh, they were in a gathering. And they said, of course we know who you are. We prayed for you this month. Brother, for 22 years, they never ceased to pray. Wow. And that's another way that we should really trust in the Lord. Many people witness to Muslims and others, and they think they have to see results with their own eyes. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. You plant and water, and the Lord will bring growth to that, right. uh, you know. And now they are, uh, you know, supporter of the ministry. We connected together. We are in, uh, in always in dialogue with each other. Uh, they're definitely, uh, you know, uh, a blessing to me. Look, look how their faithfulness resulted in a ministry that is international. And uh, God can use anyone uh, to bring about glory to his name. And I hope I'm always humbling myself and reminding myself it's his work it's not my that's work. right that's no. right you know brother and also it is you're right it is difficult to reach family you know jesus said a prophet is never accepted among his own people uh and so i would ask our viewers as well to remember uh brother al's mother who was ill and his brother please pray for them uh, my wife and i pray every day for our unloved saved ones um my, my wife's parents, well, her mother, the only surviving parent, is not saved. Uh, my mom, thanks be to God, came to the Lord through my my witness. And, and my father, I think, I'm not sure, but I think near the end of his life, he became open to the gospel and, and before he passed. And so please don't underestimate the power of prayer. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 17 says, pray without ceasing. And so please pray for our dear brother, for his mother. And his brother, uh, we, of course, we desire, as the Apostle Paul says, there's this great sorrow that I carry in my heart. He says in Romans 10, I have this great sorrow that I carry in my heart for my people, Israel. And I would wish myself accursed, anathema, if, if they could be saved. In other words, Paul was willing to say, Lord, send me to hell if you could just save the Jewish people. And so that is the heart of a, of a, of a believer who cares for the lost. Um, and brother, we're so happy to hear as well that you've gone on to uh, higher education and, and you're doing a, a PhD right now uh, under doc, Dr. Uh, Mark Dury uh, from the Melbourne School of Theology in Australia. And I believe you, it says that you're doing your PhD in the area of uh, early Quranic manuscripts. Can you maybe share a little bit about that and why you felt the Lord wanted you to do that work in that area? 
Hey, man. Um, really, at the beginning, I was debating about a topic, but uh, I, I, the Lord just kept gravitating me towards uh, the Quran. And I kept saying, you know what, this is me just because I'm a former Muslim. Somehow, I think it's easy for me just to focus on something I'm familiar with. No, no, no I want to do something else. And, and it's amazing how after a couple of years of search, the Lord returned me back to the topic of the Quran. And at that point, I connected with Dr. Brubaker, Dr. Uh, Mark Dury, uh, yes. Dr. J. Smith, and the likes, and many uh, Quran, early Quranic scholars. And uh, and I just realized, you know, um, no better than someone who knows the Quran uh, can really destroy this book, technically speaking. And I, I don't want to do it because I want to glorify the Quran. I want to do it to show that the Quran is not the book that my Muslim people think it is. But obviously, I want to do it from an academic standpoint. I mean, we have to watch how we do it and how we say it. But another reason why, brother, I, I wanted to also focus on the Quranic manuscript is that there are so many variants of the Quran in the Quranic manuscript, so many different verses yes. and a variety of things that many of my Muslim friends don't even know anything about it. So we need to bring it up to the light. And I say this, and I say this with a broken heart, that there are a lot of wonderful scholars out there that they're always afraid of speaking truth publicly. Yes. And you know what? Uh, the time for that is over, I tell them. This is the time for us to bring to light anything and everything. We have uh, social media platforms and everything. We have to let the people know we can do it in love. We can do it in kindness. Yeah. We're not, we don't have to yell at people or anything. But this is the Quran you believe in. It has problems from the get-go. From the moment it started, it, it wasn't the book you thought it to be. Right. And that's why I have a passion for Quranic manuscripts. And obviously, I don't want to you know, discuss a whole lot of details yet because we are working towards a focus of my research that, Good. by the grace of God, it, it will go in to show that the Quran that Muslims believe is a perfectly preserved book is just the opposite of that. Wow. And I'm so excited for you, brother, because I know that uh, I know that uh, Do Dr. Daniel Brubaker, who's a personal friend of both of us, I know him as well. And of course, my good friend, Dr. Jay Smith. Um, um, I remember Dr. Smith got involved in Islamic apologetics when I first started debating Muslims. Shabir Ali, I debated him for the first time in 1992 at the University of Toronto. And I remember uh, Jay saying, oh, man, I was just doing starting like master's work and so forth and so on. But people like Jay Smith and people like Daniel Brubaker, of course, the, the late Keith Small, who's now uh, with the Lord, uh, he did some important work in that area. Uh, and, and, and like yourself, uh, I'm so glad that we have people who are coming to the front. And I'm just going to share something here, brother, that I shared last time uh, when, I, when I had Dr. Smith on my program. And, and here I have a copy of the, the New Testament. This is the uh, Greek New Testament, uh, Nissel Allen 28. And I just want to show you something here that uh, when I open the page here, you'll notice you have the Greek text up here. And at the bottom, you have what's called the critical apparatus. Um, do you know how long Christians have had uh, critical apparatus uh, in, their, in their Bibles for? I don't want to sound like Jay. You know, when Jay is on, he always puts you on the spot and starts asking questions. Well, I had I had Jay yesterday, and I I, I felt like that was a perfect thing to have him at late night, so I can go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> there you go, there you go. So, so folks, we have we, our, our our Greek New Testament, and also uh, our Hebrew uh, Bible, which I think I have a copy of here. Um, here I have a copy of the of the Hebrew Bible, and you'll notice the same thing. You've got uh, the Hebrew text on top, and at the bottom you have this critical apparatus here at the bottom of the page. Yeah. Now, why why is that important? And you'll know why too, brother uh, Al. That's I important. have these two in the, in the seminary, of course. Yeah, so, yeah. Let I me mean, you finish your thought. I'm going to comment on something. Yeah, the Go earliest ahead. the earliest apparatus we have of the Greek New Testament dates to 1550. Think about that by Stephanus. Uh, 1550 Christians have have worked on the the original languages and they've been putting out a critical apparatus of their Greek New Testament because they're being transparent and they're being open about various variants that grew in the transmission of the text now guess how many textual uh, guess how many Qurans we have today with a critical apparatus I think the, you know the answer brother zilch Nada. Zero. So why so do you, you think brother, that I am 
That's one of the things that I'm going to focus on, basically. That's Good. all I have to say. And I don't want to share exactly. details because no, 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 no. I would like not for me to share a whole no, lot. No, no, no. And, and I would advise against that because uh, that is your doctoral research and, and it's supposed to be a contribution to the field. And so absolutely not. Uh, we'll all know about it when you get your doctoral dissertation published. Um, but uh, all that to say that uh, I, I think that the work that you're doing, brother, is very important. And as you know, many Muslims today, like Yasser Qadi, who talks about holes in the standard narrative. And he's uh, honest. The guy yeah. is honest when he said it. It's yeah. sad that he changed his mind about it. Yeah, it's sad because he started backpedaling after that. Um, but but I think the work that you're doing in this area is, is very important because the mantra that we keep hearing from our Muslim friends is always the same. The Quran is the same Quran that it's been since the time of Muhammad. No difference in any letter. Uh, the, 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 some will even say no difference in, in uh, the accent points, even though there were no accent points in the time of Muhammad. But um, can you let us know, brother, uh, what, what you hope to bring out of this, the, the results of your research? What do you hope it will contribute to, 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 to Christians, apologists, those in the field of apologetics? And what do you hope it will bring about with our Muslim friends? Well, first, the Muslims, really. My hope is that they will see that it's not just Dr. Brubaker who is showing with complete honesty that there are problems with the Quranic manuscripts, even though Dr. Brubaker never once attacked Muslims or Islam. No. He's just doing a research as a scholar, and yet he gets all kind of accusations, unfortunately. But I want him to know that even myself, a former Muslim from the heartland of Islam in Saudi, is telling you he is right and there are problems and the original narrative has holes, lots of holes in it. And it's time for you, especially in a day like this where we have access to internet, YouTube, everything. It's time for you to begin to look at these evidence closely. Don't let the scholars and the clerk mislead you. This is a personal decision and it's a matter of salvation. And as for the, uh, my friends who are believers and uh, Christians, I want them to benefit from it. But just by being equipped, uh, I, I, you have no idea how much these things can strengthen your faith, of course, yes. first of all. But then at the same time, hopefully they can use it to reason with their Muslim friends and help them come to know the Lord through the only preserved word of God. And that's the Bible. Right, right. And that's great, brother. And we're thankful for that. And of course, this is an area where, again, our Christian brothers and sisters need to be educated because that is one of the, 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 the frontal points of attack that many of our Muslim friends take is to attack the Bible and its reliability. And, and why do you have this 1 John 5, 7 in the King James Version? And, and, and they bring various questions about the variants in the Bible, to which we should say we've been aware of it for over 400 years. We know about these. And they don't shake the Christian faith in any way. They don't attack any cardinal teaching of the Christian faith. However, when it comes to the Quran, um, many of, of the Muslim imams are being disingenuous. Uh, they're not telling us the truth about the transmission of the Quran. Uh, and so when I do things like that, brother, uh, I'm usually accused of being Islamophobic, even though I'm quoting Muslim sources like the Hadith and and uh, and the Sira literature and so forth. So, but brother, you don't, you, don't know Arabic, brother. you don't know Arabic. That, that's why. <laughs> yeah. it's well, when my Muslim friends say, hey, you don't know Arabic. Well, I know a little bit of Arabic. Uh, I mean, it's Semitic. I know Hebrew, but... Uh, they say, well, if you don't know Arabic, you can't understand the, the Quran, to which I say, do you know Hebrew or Greek? No. Well, then you can't comment on the Bible. So now we're at a stalemate. What do we do? We can't talk now. <laughs> so so if you're going to say, well, you, you need to know Arabic in order to understand the Quran, well, then you need to know Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek in order to understand the, the Bible. Uh, and, and then you'll hear the most, uh, you know, you'll hear Muslims say, well, Jesus didn't, Jesus, uh, Jesus didn't speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic. Well, here's my answer to that. Jesus didn't speak Arabic because he exactly. speaks Arabic in the Quran. Exactly. But he may have spoken Greek because Greek was the lingua franca of the first century. And there's indications in the gospel that Jesus could speak Greek because the word the word hypocrite, for example, is a Greek word. And there's other words that Jesus used in his vocabulary that would have derived from Greek. But th that's not the point. The point is we, you know, we, we always want in apologetics, we want an, an even field, right, brother? We want to keep the balance, uh, the scales just and, and straight. 
but many of our Muslim friends, unfortunately, do not do that. So, so brother, I know we're coming near to the hour. We've got another five minutes, and I know you you have a, a family commitment that you need to get to. Um, are, are there any words by which you can encourage uh, our viewers? I mean, you've given us a wonderful testimony, and uh, you know it 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 really moved me inside when I heard this wonderful testimony, how you lost everything for the sake of Christ. Are there, are there any words, any parting words that you can share with our viewers uh, on, on how they can love their Muslim friends uh, more effectively? You know, I, I take the word Islam as an acronym. I sincerely love all Muslims. That's how I look at Islam. I see it as an abbreviation. I sincerely love all Muslims, and I do. Uh, are there any words that you can share with our, our viewers on how to be better witnesses towards our Muslim friends? Absolutely. I, I think uh, we need to look at Muslims first and foremost as people made in the image of God. That's extremely important. And the idea of we don't like them because of what they believe in, they're victims of the ideology. They don't know any better. I mean, when you're born into something, that's all you know. Our job is to be sympathetic to the fact that they behave and believe in certain things that even though you and I know it's not true, they don't know the truth. The God right. of this age has blinded their mind, and we have to always depend on God. It's the work of God, not our work. Amen. Also, gain uh, take advantage of the fact that God is bringing Muslims to our backyard, to our own backyard. You don't even have to go to their backyard anymore. Right. So God has a purpose. Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 26, 27, summarizes his purpose in three ways. Uh, there are three parts of that purpose, that they may seek him in hope that they may reach out to him and find him. I came to the States. God put me in a place uh, near people in a specific uh, geographical area for a specific period of time so that I may know him as a result of this. And the result is that I came to know him. So God brings people to our backyard for a purpose. We need to take advantage of that. It's a go-to ministry. Go right. and make disciples. So right. we have to initiate. We have to go and meet right. with them. Right. And then uh, another thing, never give up. Like I said, the family never gave up. They prayed for the seed that was planted, trusting that God will bring growth to it. Now, what were they waiting for me to call? They probably didn't even dream that I'll be calling them anymore. It's been 22 years that have passed. But God was faithful enough to connect me with them, to encourage them. You know why, brother? Because when I connected with them, they told me they stopped doing ministry among internationals. They thought it wasn't working. Wow. These are their own words. Wow. And yet God says, you know what? It was working. And it will continue to work because I am in the middle of it, you know. So, so we have to trust that God is the one who's doing the work. And and just finally, we need to learn how to articulate our faith. I, I don't want to say defend it. Maybe people, people think like it's fighting. Just learn how to articulate it because a Muslim, when they ask you a question, you don't know how to answer it. In their mind, you see, you're not standing on the truth. I'm happy with my religion. No, we need to answer it. We need to take advantage of the fact that they're opening a door for you for discussion. Now, you can be frank with a Muslim and say, listen, brother, I mean, I want you to come to Christ first. That's the most important thing. We can deal with these other issues, you know, the millennial or the rapture. I, that's not what's mm -hmm. saved. Let's focus right. on what is important. But then right. we can deal with those issues. If, if you're passionate about them, you're, you're, they mean something important to you, we'll, we'll talk about it. But, right. but I want you to know that we need Christ. Everyone needs Christ. So, so we need to take advantage of that opportunity and not wait for too long because we don't want right. to offend them or we feel like we want to get training. No, you don't have to get training. The family that God used in my life, they were not seminary trained or anything. They were living by faith, trusting the word of God. And the power wow. of the Holy it's yeah. amazing. And I think it's an important distinction you made there, uh, Brother Al, that we need to distinguish between the ideology and the people, the worldview and the people. Because what does Paul say in, in, in Ephesians 6, 12? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the evil spiritual powers. In other words, there's something beyond outside of them that is, is the enemy, that is the main culprit. And so we need to understand that whether you're dealing with Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, whatever they are, that these are human beings, image bearers of God. And we need to understand that we are bringing down, what does Paul say, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5? He says that we are destroying arguments. We are bringing down strongholds, bringing every thought captive to Jesus Christ. And so what we are dealing with is ideas, worldviews, and ideas have consequences. And what we need to understand is this, is that 
that human being, that Muslim is listening to the ideology of Islam. And that's why terms like Islamophobia are ridiculous because uh, Islam has no feelings. Islam is an ideology. You can't hurt an ideology, but we are forbidden from hurting people. We're not told to go and do harm to our neighbor. That is wrong. That is hatred. But we need to always remember they're not the, the ultimate enemy is Satan and his minions. And, and the God of this age has blinded their minds. Notice what it says. It doesn't say he blinded their eyes. They can see. They got visible physical eyes. But he's blinded the mind. Why? Because the mind is the faculty of reason. This is where we think we bring ideas together. And so our hope and our prayer is that the Lord will remove that veil from their minds that they might see. And and Brother Al, uh, you've only confirmed for me tonight once again that, uh, that uh, ex-Muslims make the best Christians. And I have found in my ministry that, that Muslims who come to faith in Christ, I have found to be the most loving and the most passionate Christian believers. And so I'm so thankful for you. I'm thankful for your life, for your ministry. Uh, we'll continue to pray for your mother and for your brother. And uh, brother, I hope to have you uh, on the show again uh, in, in the near future. I'll be honored, brother. Thank you so much for thinking of me. And uh, everyone who followed us here, thank you so much for doing so. Thank I want to make sure everyone have subscribed to your channel. Please announce this channel because you're going to see amazing work through this channel. Thank you so much, Brother Al. And so everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, those of you who've joined us from, uh, from uh, Al's uh, YouTube channel, again, a warm welcome to you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, we, we, we ask God's blessings on you, and we hope to see you again in the near future. So thanks again, everybody. God bless you, and make you a blessing to others. Bye for now.